Welcome to Small Biz Life, episode 10. Does this sound familiar? Oh my God, I have so much to do today. Don't forget to breathe. But I have almost 400 emails in my inbox and 30 phone calls to make. Have you looked into getting a virtual assistant yet? Oh, and I need to schedule all my social media posts. Did you drink anything today? I had coffee. Did you eat today? Did I mention coffee's a bean? This is Small Biz Life. Yes, I'm Jeffrey W. Ingram, and I'm here today with... I'm Kristen Ingram. Ooh, shocking. (laughs) (laughs) It's like it's it's new and different, but not. It is new and noteworthy from what I hear, but uh, different would also apply. Well, you are a little different. I'm very different. (laughs) (laughs) But yes, uh, this is Small Biz Life, a show where we like to get into the weeds of small business, not just people's experiences on how they grew to su- grow to succeed, but also how how you just survive day to day and how you make those correct choices to move forward and keep your momentum. And we've got some weeds for you today. Oh, yes. We're hip deep into weeds today. <laughs> so let's get started. What uh, We always start the show with what's in the news. So mm-hmm. what did you find this week? And it's weedy. It's weedy. Okay. So this is for all of you Android users out there. And there is a n- not necessarily a super new kind of malware for your phone, but it is, there are a couple ones called Shindun, Suanet, and Shifty Bug that you might have to replace your phone if you get these kind of uh, Trojans on there. Uh, even if you reset the phone, even if you restore the OS, they are very, very difficult to get off, get rid of. Wow. Yeah. Replace your phone. Yeah. Some people are having to replace their phones because they cannot get the viruses off their phones. And they're, they're malware. Uh, the, they usually spy on you. Um, the trick is most of these are coming from non- uh, Google Play Play stores. So a lot of times what people will do are that they will go to different places to get access to different kinds of applications. And some of these are very basic, like basically uh, tainted Twitter, Facebook applications, two-factor authentication applications, which are used to supposedly make your authentication even better. But they're infected with this malware on some other sites that actually offer uh, downloads. And the reason I really bring this one up is there are a lot of infections that are showing up in the U.S. And a lot of times when you get some of these more malicious malwares, they typically affect countries that are poor, where people um, try and get legitimate software for free, legitimate paid software for free. And that's how a lot of times they get infections built right into it. But these infections appear to be all over. Uh, I don't know how necessarily big they are, but they really take over your phone. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind, if you're an Android user, use your Play Store. Right. And th- and that's the thing, you know, stay within, if you're an Android user, use the Play Store. If you're on Apple, use the App Store. I know people, they try to find paid apps that are free, you know, and typically the the sites that you're going to find those on you put yourself at huge risk. I mean, just go back 10 years for people downloading free movies and music and all of the infections that came with that. Uh, They're now using apps to do the same thing. So, wow. And I, I'm not saying I'm not expert on, on app stores. Um, I know like Samsung has one. And my thing is if you're going to use a non Google play or non Apple store uh, store to download apps on your phone, which on, Apple, I'm not sure if you can do that unless you root your phone. But uh, if you do that, do a lot of research on the store to make sure that that you're not getting involved into a store that is going to open you up to downloading something as what you think would be benign, like, oh, Twitter or Facebook, and then have your phone compromised and be forced to replace it. Wow. That's pretty major. That's pretty major. And in our tips this week, later on, you're going to tell us how we can avoid some of that. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm going to start doing, cause I've had a lot of bad news for, uh, people recently is I have a good article that I'll be going over sort of peri- periodically. I'll go back to it and grab one of the Northeastern university tips for avoiding malware. Ooh, 
Woohoo. Yes. All right. Awesome. So you can look forward to that near the end of the show. Um, so my article this week is about health insurance. The open enrollment period for the Affordable Care Act is now open. It opened on November 1st. So if you're looking to buy health insurance for yourself or your employees, you have until December 15th to sign up for your coverage to start on January 1st of 2016. So you've got about uh, about five weeks. Now on the ACA, you're not buying group policies there. It's only individuals that the employees would be hunting for their own, correct? No, you can actually, um, if you go to healthcare.gov, mm-hmm. there's actually a small business section, which I'll link to in the show notes. Um, and you can actually get coverage for your employees there mm-hmm. as well. I do that, of course. <laughs> depending on your state. What I would recommend if you've got a small business, though, I would consider going with an agent, a health insurance agent that can look at all of your options. Because some of my clients are doing better through pricing with the ACA, and some of them are doing better going through private plans. Mm. You know, you if you go with a broker, they can look at both options Mm. and let you know what's the best for you. Now, if you do have employees, they actually they made a change to the law back in July. You used to be able to buy individual plans for all your employees and you could deduct them, but you wouldn't qualify for the ACA credit. There's a tax credit for small business owners that buy insurance for their employees. But what a lot of my clients were finding is that it was actually less expensive to buy individual plans for all their employees, even without the credit. Mm Mm-hmm. But Congress changed the law effective July 1st that if you buy individual plans for all your employees, you can't deduct them any longer. It's not a deductible expense for your business. So those of you that went to individual plans, you need to go back to a group plan in order to be able to deduct the expense. (laughs) At least until next year. Right. And we are finding that if you can't deduct the health insurance, it ends up being more expensive having the individual plans and the group plans. Oh, okay. So everybody's converting over. It's costing them more money to do so. I know. Yeah. It's really frustrating. But going with a broker, they can look at all the different options that are out there. Whereas if you go to healthcare.gov, they're just going to show you what's in the marketplace. So you want to make sure that you shop all your options. A good way to find a broker in your area is to check out your chamber of commerce and look for insurance brokers In order to sell ACA plans, I know you have to go through a lot of training. There's like a certification process. So the people that are selling ACA plans, they really know those plans well. Now, they still call them those navigators or? Well, it depends. I mean, if you're going to healthcare.gov, the nice thing with that is it can actually send you to the resources for your state if you want to do it on your own. Hmm. But it doesn't cost you any more to go to a health insurance broker. Wow. So, you know, I know people that have spent days trying to navigate this and figure Mm. out, you know, what is the best plan and what are the different options. You can sit down with an insurance broker. It won't cost you any more and they will do all the research for you. Wow. So it's worth it. And most of these, you know, these health insurance brokers, they are small business owners too. So you're helping out, you know, a fellow small business owner. Mm. And they're great about keeping you up to date on all the changes because ACA is changing all the time. Well, you figure that's a pretty major change because I know there's a lot of people were concerned that small employers were going to start dropping employees and apparently they did. So they changed the law to make them essentially put them back on. Well, the thing is, you know, what I found with my clients is they weren't dropping their employees. They were still paying for the same level of coverage, but they just put everybody on individual Mm. plans. And the government didn't like that because it was harder for them to track. So, (laughs) and it was saving small businesses money. And apparently they didn't like that either. (laughs) It's so frustrating. I know. So they changed the law so that they had to put them back in those group plans. Mm. I think the the problem was, is that with the cost sharing model, the groups were really getting hurt Mm. with the cost sharing. So, yeah, most definitely. So watch out for that. So you've got until December 15th to get your health insurance plan in place for January 1st. And that's my in the news this week. Mm. It's actually, it's, it's kind of interesting. This week's topic um, is all about trying to find out what your customers want 
And I think I'm a member of a couple of really big groups on Facebook. And I see this all the time that people kind of put out there like, what should I do? You know, what should I do this? Should I do that? And they're not necessarily asking their avatar or their ideal customer. They're asking a random group of people who may or may not be their ideal customer, who may or may not be the person that's actually going to end up buying their product when their product comes out. So today we're going to talk a little bit about how do you actually figure out what your customers want? I, I think this is a great question. I think this is one that a lot of people struggle with because, you know, especially when you're starting off, it's hard to even understand. I mean, you think you know who your customer is and sometimes it's hard to even know who your customer is. And there's a fear that if you ask them, you might not get answers that you like. I think that might be part of it, but I think part of it too is it's very easy to, um, to put it on, on, on to the, these people you respect in some of these groups, because there are some really smart people there. However, they're taking it from their perspective and maybe even from their knowledge of their clients, not from your avatar, who's the only person who's going to, uh, or who's going to be the most likely person to do business with you. Right. Exactly. So, you know, the thing you've got to do is you've got to figure out who your ideal customer is and then figure out what they want. So if you have not listened to episode four, we talk all about how to identify your ideal customer and how to create a profile for them. So if you haven't listened to that episode yet, you might want to check out episode four. Mm. But once you've figured out who your ideal customer is and you know where they hang out, and hopefully they're hanging out on your website or they're hanging out on your email (laughs) list, right? Go out and ask them. Mm -hmm. Create a survey. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of the big players online, they're actually doing annual surveys just to kind of check up on their customers to see if the content they're developing or the products they're developing are actually resonating Mm -hmm. with their customers. Can you talk a little bit about some free ways that people can develop surveys? Probably the easiest would be a survey monkey type of survey. And essentially, uh, that is a website and you can do it for free. I believe you get their branding involved in it if you use it for free, but if you're small, that's fine. And you get 10 questions free if you want to do a survey that's longer than that, which I really wouldn't recommend you do a survey longer than that, but you can do up to 10 questions Mm -hmm. for free. It also helps show how engaged your clients are in your email newsletters. Um, because it'll give them an activity you're requesting them to do. And if you don't do that a lot, you might not know because maybe you're just sending out content and not a lot of call to action. So this will help get you to better understand that even if they're going to connect to do the call to actions, you do put in your email newsletters. And that's actually the first most important answer you're going to receive from it, I think. Well, maybe not the most important, but it's a very important uh, question I've answered. And then for the people that do, you know, you, you can ask a series of questions. Uh, one of um, my favorite online people right now is Tim Graw. I'm not sure if I've mentioned him on the show before, probably. Yeah, a number of times. Um, He's the author of um, Your First Thousand Copies. Your and- First Thousand Copies. He does a lot of courses on how to market your content online for books, uh, both fiction and nonfiction. Uh, essentially, sort of how, what authors should focus on for a platform online. And if your mainstay is an author, this is a guy you should probably uh, get to know better, at least read his book. I just finished a a course up with with him, uh, one of, I don't know how many courses I've taken through him because he does a lot of free courses as well too, but uh, he sent out a survey and the thing I really liked about it was one, it gives me a chance to get feedback. I like giving feedback to courses more so when I like them than when I don't. And the brilliant thing about his is he goes through all these questions to ask and he leaves a lot of it to writing, which makes sense for his avatar. Like here's a text box to tell me what you think, which makes it hard to gather the data. But you also want, want, want to make it as appealing to your audience as well on how you ask the questions. But he'll ask a question, you know, maybe a couple of yes or no questions on you know if you liked it, if you thought it was more helpful, what you liked, what you didn't like about it. And then I think the smartest thing he did at the end of it, the last question he asked, and he does this in all the surveys I've gotten from him is, 
Oh, do you mind if I put anything up in this survey as essentially a, a customer, uh, a testimonial on my website? And you can say yes or no to that as well, too. So he will do the survey to follow up on his course and his content. And then he'll actually use that to try and gather testimonials as well. That's really smart. Yeah. I like that. Another option that I've used to create surveys is I've used Google Forms. Mm. The nice thing with Google Forms is it's completely free. Yeah. You can ask as many questions as you want. And it's really easy to set up. Yeah. They give you lots of different question options. You can do, and you can do this with um, SurveyMonkey as well, but you can do single, you know, single response. You mm. can do like multiple response, like check boxes. You can do drop down menus. You can, you know, ask people to prioritize things, you know, on a scale of, you know, out of these five things, you know, which is the most important, which is the second most important. You can do text boxes. All the responses dump into a spreadsheet for you. It will also take the information. You can look at it via pie charts or you can look at just the, the percentage information. It gives you a lot of different ways to look at the data, which is really nice. And mm -hmm. you can also look to see the responses for the same person. Mm. So this is, you know, respondent number one, and you can see all of the responses that they gave, which mm -hmm. is really nice. Because sometimes when you're looking at your data that you collect from a survey, it's hard to tell, you know, okay, 50% of these people are my avatar, mm -hmm. but what were their responses, yeah. right? And I think one of the great things about doing a survey, always ask for demographic information. Yeah. Because you want to see if the people that are responding to the survey and mm -hmm. the people who are on your email list are actually who you think your avatar is. Yes. Because you might be off on who your avatar actually mm -hmm. is. And so having a survey where you get, you know, 100 people to respond or 200 yeah. people to respond, especially if they're on your email list. Mm -hmm. If they don't match up with the demographic that you have in mind for your avatar, exactly. you might need to start kind of tweaking your content. Most definitely. You know, be like if, if we put out a survey, we found out the major listener of our podcast were Fortune 500 CEOs. Um, <laughs> whoops. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think just knowing who your avatar is, is because that is, I, I think, really the toughest thing. And that can shift over time, especially if the content you do starts to slightly shift into a maybe a, a connected uh, topic, but is, you know, like say with Michael Hyatt, another name I've probably never mentioned on here before. Oh, not once. It's like he shifted a lot more into uh, leadership and goal setting and stuff like that. So even though it's surrounded with the same kind of content, when we first started listening to him, it's it, it, it shifted a bit in what it does. So that might shift who his demographic is. Right. When you're doing your survey, I like using surveys when I'm trying to come up with a new product when I'm trying to kind of test the market for either a new service I'm going to put mm -hmm. out or topics that I want to talk about, what I would do is I would have a couple questions about demographic information, things like male or female, age ranges. If you're talking to small business owners, you know, how old is the business and put some ranges in. Mm -hmm. And then if you have specific ideas for topics or products, put those into the survey mm -hmm. as a multiple choice question or as a rank these topics, you know, in order of importance for you. And then also let customers give you other ideas. Yes. But the thing is, you want to give them some ideas. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't just want to say, all right, if I'm going to do a podcast next week, what should the topic be? Yeah. Because sometimes people will, they'll have a hard time coming up with things. Mm -hmm. But if you give them some ideas, then go, okay, I like, you know, I like this one. I like that one. Oh, and now I'm thinking about other things. Yeah. But you got to kind of like lead them into that. I think there's a, a secondary bonus in there as well, too, is if you think you have that next viral takeoff product that's going, the survey will also act to help start building buzz towards the product. And one, you'll get an idea if you're right, because, you know, let's say like 95% of the participants are all like, oh, Number three it has to be three has to be three. And that was the one that you, that was your main idea. And then you had a couple others that were around there, but if they all start focusing on that, it's going to actually start their excitement at that point. 
and it, you know it's the tease for for an upcoming movie it's the trailer you know and it, it's the very first contact you'll have with them on the product so it's also marketing as well too i don't think you should treat it as that when you make it but you have to realize that it is and once you do the survey especially if you get a huge response go yeah and that's you know if even if you're doing things like like a new logo design or you're publishing a book and you've got multiple book mm. covers, get your audience engaged in the decision making. Yeah. Because if you have three different book covers to choose from and you send it out to your audience, mm -hmm. you're helping empower them. They feel like they're part of the decision making. Yeah. And if there's one cover that they all agree is better than the others, there you go. Your audience just told you which one to pick. And if you disagree with them, realize who's right in the scenario. It's not you. Right. Exactly. Exactly. One thing I like to get to, too, is going back a bit to the long surveys. You might really have a need for a long survey. And so here's my suggestion. Just I work with a lot of data sometimes. And uh, one of the areas that this happens in is the census. So they have two different types of census forms that go out. The short form, which is essentially how many people live here. And the long form, which is the American Community Survey. And that has lots of data and some people don't want to fill it out. Now you can't force them to fill it out or try and bully them like, like uh, the census bureau might be able to, but what you can do is try and incentivize them because some people like me, if I have the time at the moment, I don't mind giving more feedback. Uh, other people might not want to. So you can say at the end of your short survey, say, if you would like to learn more or, or, uh, if you don't mind, if I ask you more questions, click on this link below and, you know, offer them an incentive, give them, you know, a, a sales price on something or some exclusive content that they'll get for doing that for you as a way to incentivize them to get you that longer form data if you need it. But it's only fair that you compensate them in some way. Right. Or even if you do like, even if you do a giveaway, you know, that I'll select one person at random to win a $50 Amazon gift card. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you think about it, the amount of data that you would get for that $50 is going to benefit your business mm -hmm. so much more than the $50 that you spend. Yeah. So, and the, the other thing that you can do um, kind of along the same lines that Jeff was talking about is you can bring out the short survey and then ask people, you know, if, if you're willing to help us out more in the future, give us your email address, get those email addresses onto an email list, mm -hmm. a separate email list, and then email them the long form mm -hmm. because you figure they've already filled out the short form, right? So they've got some interest in your business. You'll have a higher chance of getting those people to fill out the long form than if you just send the long form out to all mm -hmm you know, of the people on your email and list. And the thing too, from a, a quality of audience standpoint, the people who are willing to fill out the survey are, are more actionable for you, at least at that moment. And that's one of those things where they will talk about segmenting your email uh, mailing list, which I'm horrible at doing, but it is a good thing in a business sense to do. Right. You know, and be realistic about how long it's going to take people to fill out your survey. <laughs> Don't say, oh, I've got this really quick survey. And then it's like 40 questions. Mm -hmm. And if it's 40 questions, my suggestion as a, and this is the developer, Jeffrey, break it down into pages for them. So th they don't go through and, and take, you know, an hour of their time to fill out the long survey for you and go to press the submit button and the web app that happens to be storing has timed out and uh, they've lose all of the data they put in and test it out too, before you send it out. So if you create a form in any product, because there are a lot of products to help you do this, I'm sure there are WordPress plugins. There are probably specific websites like survey monkey, you know, sit one out, fill out the survey yourself but then wait an hour or two, just leave it open, wait a couple hours, you know, wait a day and click on that button and see, and see what happens. And if it collapses, you're going to have to rethink the way you do it because if they do that and they get through a long survey and they press that submit button, they're probably not going to go back in. Right. And don't just don't create a 40 question survey. Just don't do it. I mean, the thing is, you should be doing a survey to try to create products or services or content. So therefore, you know, if you have, you know, say four or five demographic questions, mm -hmm. and then you do like maybe 
probably like five or six other questions max, then it's only 10 questions total. The demographic information is really important for you. So you're going to want that. And then if you can't, you know, if you can't collect the data that you need in five to six questions, you need to rethink what you're doing. So don't create really long surveys. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because people will not fill them out. Okay. So now I want to talk about, okay, so what do you do if you don't have an email list or you have a very small email list? Start one. Okay. So the first thing you want to do is you want to start an email (laughs) list if you don't have one. Okay. The reason that email lists are so powerful is because you know, you're going to land in their inbox. Okay. So somebody signs up for your email list they're going to get the email. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you put something up on Facebook or you put something up on Twitter, first Facebook, you know, only, what is it now? It's it's six to 8% typically for a page, the people that will see your content. Uh, Something something along the lines of 6%. Yeah, Yeah. so only about 6% of people who like your page are actually gonna see your content. Mm -hmm. You wanna put a link to your survey on your Facebook page, but that's not going to get you a whole lot of traffic unless you boost it, Mm -hmm. unless you pay to boost the post. Yeah. You know, with how, with the speed at which Twitter moves and people are following, you know, hundreds or thousands of people, the likelihood that they're going to see your post on Twitter is probably not very good. Mm -hmm. When you have an email list, you know, you're going to land in their email box. And when you use a double opt-in, they're, they're saying twice that, no, they want you in their email box because they want to get to the content in a much more intimate way too than Facebook. It's like literally it's it's in there next to the email from their mother or their grandmother yeah, and all of the Viagra spam too. But, you know, <laughs> uh, hopefully they have a good filter and most of that gets filtered out. But it, they want to interact with you in a personal pl- place for them, not just out in the open. Right. And through a lot of surveys that we've read, people – people really like to protect their email box Mm because it is like a personal place for them. So when people give you permission to go into their email box, they're much more likely to engage with you. Yeah. So, you know, so if you don't have an email list, you want to put one together. Mm. Okay. So a couple different places that you can hit if you do not have an email list right now, if you have strong traffic on your website, you can actually put a, you can put a pop-up, to come up on your website, mm. I would highly recommend that when you do your pop up, have it be have it use something called exit intent. Yeah. Okay. Don't just have it pop up as soon as people get to the page, because if they're a first time visitor, let them acquaint themselves with your website mm-hmm. first. An exit intent pop up will only pop up when the person starts to scroll up to the top of the browser, like they're going to close the page. Mm-hmm. Okay. And there's a couple of them that you can use. I really like one by King Sumo. Mm -hmm. And what it will allow you to do is it will allow you to actually put a link to your survey into the pop-up box. So a lot of people use it for email signups, but you can also use it for things like that. And I would suggest uh, with King Sumo, sign up for their email newsletter to see an effective email newsletter. I mean, they get me to buy stuff all the time. Yeah, they are unbelievable marketers. Yeah. They do a great job. And also, too, we've gotten some really good deals on um, on courses, on you know plugins for our website, on all different types of tools, marketing images, uh, all just they have lots of stuff. And yeah, it's kind of like Groupon for online marketing. Yes. You know, where they have these deals that are very short term. Creates a lot of scarcity, as I've been told. Yeah, exactly. But we've gotten some really, really good deals and some awesome content. It's helped us. It's helped introduce us um, to people that we probably wouldn't have found any other way. So um, so check that out. That's one option. You know, it actually puts something up on your home base. You know, you can, you know, put it on your Facebook page. If you have a Facebook group, put in your Facebook group. Um, Put it on your Twitter and all your other social media avenues. If you're involved with any groups that will allow you to share that content and Mm -hmm. your avatar is there. So I'm in a couple of groups where once a week they will allow you to share something. That's a great place to share your survey. If you have 
you know, if you have a marketing budget for your survey, and especially like if you're going to do, you know, give away like a gift card or something mm-hmm. to somebody who responds, you can do some some Facebook ads to try to get people to answer your survey. You know, you can you can promote things in Twitter. There's a lot, you know, you could even do Google ads if you mm-hmm. wanted to, you know, if you're really, you know, if you really want to engage, yeah. if you really want to get a lot of responses and you can use your survey to build your email list. Mm-hmm. And the other thing to remember too, is if you do advertising through uh, like, like really targeted towards your avatar through Facebook or Google or Twitter, and you, you don't get a lot of responses um, that might once again uh, tell you something about who your avatar is and is not. Right. And the nice thing with, you know, the nice thing with Facebook advertising or Google AdSense is, or Google AdWords, you know, with AdWords, you can decide to pay just if they click or you can pay if they are, you know, if they see it. Mm-hmm. So you can kind of decide how you want, you know, you're going to pay more per click than you will per view. Mm-hmm. But if you really want to see like, you know, am I in tune with my avatar? Mm-hmm. If you do pay per click and nobody clicks. Yeah. Then you might have an issue. And it could also not just be your content, but it could also be uh, your uh, marketing drive to try and get them to do your survey uh, might not be targeted well towards your avatar as well. So don't just assume that it's not your avatar, but either, the way you're trying to reach them is not the avatar or, you know, maybe it's the the image and the text within the ads aren't reaching your avatar, or maybe uh, your avatar is not who your avatar, who you think your avatar is. Right. And so we said that you could build your email list based off of this survey. So what you can do is you can either put, you can either put a box at the bottom mm-hmm. that says, you know, if you're interested in learning more, you'd like to join my email list, you know, give us your email address you can use something like Zapier or If This Then That yeah. to pull the email address out of that survey mm-hmm. and put it onto your email list. Or you can give them a link to say, you know, if you'd like to sign up for my email list, click here, mm-hmm. and then it will send them to your opt-in. Excellent. So there's a couple different ways that you can that you can handle that. Make sure that you ask them if they want to be on your email list. Because if you... If you add email addresses to your email list, no matter where you get them from, and you do not have the permission of the person to join your email list, then you are in violation of can spam, which is the um, which is the law that handles, you know, email spamming. Mm-hmm. And you can get your, you know, your email list can actually get shut down. And I let me tell you something too. I'm I'm a stickler on this. If I'm in contact with people and they have my, I know they have my email address and then I show up on their list, I will report their emails to spam because that to me is a violation. Um, if I give you my email address because we're working on something together or we're, t- we're just emailing back and forth, don't throw me on your list. And there are a lot of people like me who don't necessarily want to be in your list. And I might have wanted to if asked in a better way, but when I'm not asked and I get it on an email list, that really bugs me. Yeah, I do the same thing. I report them as spam. Yeah. Because, you know, again, it's like, you know, we said that your email box is a very personal place. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't request to be on your Mm -hmm. list, don't put me on your list. Yeah, because the thing is, you know, it's like I get a lot of emails a day. Most people get a lot of emails a day. And that's not including the spam that goes straight into my spam box. For me to want to email a newsletter isn't uncommon. I like emails, newsletters. But the thing is, I want to request to have that happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. You know, the the great thing with a survey is it can help you gather information, you know, about your customers and about what they want. And it's also a really good tool for building your email list as long as you ask for permission to put people on that list. Mm. Okay. And you can connect, you know, you can connect the survey together with your email list and it is a wonderful thing. Yes. Okay. So great way to, uh, to build your list. This week's tip of the week is about malware. (laughs) <laughs> dun 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 okay so uh, once again and i'll be spreading these out over several episodes just to stay focused on one at a time in northeastern university they, they have an area where they talk about 
basically protecting yourself online and it's called secure in you. And uh, the, the first suggestion in the article I'm looking at today is outdated antivirus and unpatched devices. And this is one, if you moderately l- listen to the evening news, you should hear about viruses. And one of the biggest problems on PCs and on phones are people don't do the updates that they're supposed to. And there are a couple reasons why. Uh, one, maybe their phone's too old. They have an old Apple and uh, th- th- they know from history that if they do this next OS update, it's going to break their phone. Um, you can choose to ignore that, but you start being left out on security up- upgrades. And many people who develop malicious software um, will do it based off of known vulnerabilities. They will use these list of zero-day uh, uh vulnerabilities and and known uh issues and they will actually create malware to specifically target those things because they know that people aren't good at updating and patching their electronic hardware they connect to the internet with i mean here's the thing whenever whenever android or apple or microsoft updates a piece of software with the update, they tell everyone, including hackers, what they just fixed. Mm-hmm. So hackers will hop on that and say, okay, we know you know, that 40% of the population is not going to upgrade within the next three weeks. Mm-hmm. And so we're going to go after that vulnerability and we're going to see how far we can get this to spread. Mm-hmm. Most definitely. And now one of the the tough things, and I don't know if if Apple has the same issue, but in Android, certain carriers are very unresponsive. Uh, there's this problem that they call fragmentation in Android, where there are all kinds of Android uh, OSs sitting out there that have good because the phones have stopped being updated years ago. And um, sometimes they could be, and the carrier chooses not to because there is some expense to the carrier to make sure the patch is going to work on their version of the phone. Um, the thing is, if you are that kind of carrier and I'm not saying like Verizon or anyone like that, um, because I don't know who's the worst at this, but you know, sometimes they take a long time to come up with these updates for your phone a lot, much longer than after they've been released. Uh, if you're very concerned, go onto the social media pages, write letters complaining to these companies. Um, Be willing to change a carrier if possible uh, because only because that in itself is really the only action that that they might listen to, but um, it it might take pressure to get some of the updates on your phone that could happen that they decide not to. And if your phone's really old, realize that the more apps you keep downloading, uh, besides making your phone slower, you are putting yourself at rest the longer you use it. Well, and the, the the newer your phone is, the more likely it is you're going to get the updates faster mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because they ha- as Jeff said, they have to test it on all these different phones. And so they're going to test them on the newer phones first. And then, you know, they might eventually get to your, you know, if you have a Galaxy mm-hmm. S3. And the thing know. is, if you can't afford buying the latest Galaxy or the latest iPhone, really the performance difference between a $600 phone and a hundred dollar phone is not much, uh, but I do love my six hundred dollar phone. I, I I love it too. <laughs> and if you can afford to keep a newer, updated one, that's fine. But if you cannot, consider getting a slightly less expensive phone. You'll get all the same features. It won't feel any slower, and um, and you'll have the benefit of being at least more secure out there. Right. I think from my experience, from the research I've done, it seems like. They're pretty good at keeping them updated on, you know, in a reasonable time mm-hmm. frame for the first probably like year and a half, two years of the from the release date of the yeah. phone. And then after that, that's when they're like, okay, it's like that two years is that magical mark where they want yeah. you to upgrade your phone again. Yeah. Um, and so after two years, that's really when you're gonna see the operating systems are not are not available as quickly as they used mm-hmm. to be. Now, and the other one is the antivirus. A lot of times people will get antivirus software. There's some very good free antivirus software out there. If you do some research, you have to keep it up to date. 
If not, it won't, you know, it's a constant battle between what they know about the people who are making viruses and the viruses that are out in the wild versus the changes that the people are making. So it's a constant battle. Keep it up to date as best you can and make sure to have it scan your computer. If it doesn't do it automatically, you know, schedule it to happen like at night or whenever you're not using your computer and make sure that it's scanning your computer and that it's up to date or else it will very quickly become useless. And that's kind of, that's what I find the difference between, you know, the free versions and the paid versions is whether or not they update automatically and whether or not they scan automatically Mm. on their own. And, you know, sometimes it's worth paying, you know, you're probably looking at a couple dollars a month to get the paid version so that it's going to do those things for you automatically. Because typically when I'm working with clients, that have, you know, they get a virus on their computer, they get really bad malware on their computer. Mm -hmm. It's because, you know, the thing keeps popping up saying you need to update, you need to update, and they keep ignoring it. Mm -hmm. Ask me later. Yes. Oh, I'll do that later. Oh, Mm -hmm. I'll do that later. And then we figure out that they're six months out of date and that's why they have a virus. Mm, Most definitely. So it might be worth paying, you know, 30 bucks a year, you know, to get the paid version of the antivirus software you're using just so that you'll get those automatic updates, you'll do the automatic scans. Yes. Because 30 bucks a year is a lot cheaper than buying a new computer or <laughs> buying a new phone. Yeah, buying a new phone, like just go back to the earlier article uh, in this episode and understand the importance of this. Right. That's our tip of the week. And this week's app of the week, we're going to go back to what we were talking about, about surveys. If you don't have an email list, I think you should check out AWeber. AWeber is what we use for our email lists. And there are a lot of options out there for Mm. your email lists. And we've used a bunch of them over the years because we've been, you know, we've had email lists, oh, for, I don't even know. We've gone with the nonprofit work for at least 10 years. Yeah. So we've, you know, we've worked with a lot of them. And I have to say the the happiest I've been is with AWeber. Mm -hmm. AWeber is $47 a quarter which works out to $15.67 per month. There are cheaper options out there. But the the thing that I like about AWeber is it gives you unbelievable control. So they have a drag and drop email editor where everything is drag and drop. So you want to put your, you know, you want to put your banner on top, Mm -hmm. you drag and drop it in. You want to put pictures in, you drag and drop them in. It gives you a lot of control over where you put things, how your email looks, and it gives you a lot of control over list management. Mm -hmm. So we talked about, you know, having multiple email lists, you know, so that way you can pull somebody in, you know, they want the longer survey, but they also want your newsletter. And with a lot of email lists, you can't do that. You can't send the same email to multiple lists. You actually have to generate that email multiple times. And with AWeber, you can, once you make an email, you can actually say, okay, I want to send it to all of these lists. And Mm -hmm. you check them off and you schedule it and it goes. You know, you can do autoresponders so that you can, you know, if you develop a series of emails that you want everybody to get, you know, that's included in the price. So, you know, I think for $47 a quarter, I think it's a great value. Mm -hmm. It saves me a lot of time. It saves me a lot of headache. We actually have, um, since we both have sites, right, we actually have both lists set up Mm -hmm. within AWeber, so we don't have multiple accounts. We're just using one account for everything. Um, And it's been really easy to keep everything separate. We've never, Mm -hmm. you know, I've never accidentally sent something to your list. You've never accidentally sent anything to my list. So it makes it really clear, like, who are you sending this to? Which, because emails between our lists would probably really confuse our list people. Yeah, I think if you sent a fantasy <laughs> world building email to the small biz life email list, they it's might. It's time be to build a dragon. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe your my list or my content might be okay for you. She's like, let's build a business, and they're like, oh, really? Okay. How do no, we do that? no. I think most authors don't want it called that. Yeah, I know. They are that. They just don't want to realize that. I know. It's tough. If you are an author, you are a business owner. Yes. Ding, ding, ding. So um, we're going to put a link to AWeber in the 
in the show notes. And the other cool thing with Aweber is if you sign up for their email list, they actually, they generate a lot of really good content Mm -hmm. on how to grow your email list, um, how to convert better. So you may just want to check out, you know, check out Aweber, sign up for their email list because they do have some really good content. And you'll find they have some pretty good tools to integrate into Facebook for you. And to also, uh, there's some plugins either by Aweber or lots of companies create plugins to integrate them into your WordPress site as well too. That was our app of the week. Yeah, check out Aweber. It's awesome. I like it. And then pull out your machete and get ready to cut down some of those weeds in front of your small business. (laughs) How is that for a close, huh? (laughs) So uh, thank you so much for listening this week. Please check out our website, smallbizlife.com, where you can sign up for our email list. (laughs) Join our Facebook community which is a uh, which is a closed group. And we actually have some really good discussions over there. You can follow us on Twitter and you can check out our resource page. If you like the show, you can go to iTunes or Stitcher or we are now on Google Play. Wow. Yeah. You know, shoot us a quick rate and review because it helps other people find the show, helps build up the audience and makes things much more interesting. Ignore the whole episode where we're making fun of rev- reviews last week. <laughs> We weren't really hard on reviews last week. No, but they are a thing you have to keep in mind when you're doing things. But Right. Well, we were we were more on the, you know, don't take reviews to heart kind of thing. Yeah. But, you know, unfortunately, iTunes thinks that reviews are really important. Mm-hmm. All these sites that have the reviews there consider them important. Right. So that's why, you know, every podcaster you listen to is going to push you to rate and review their show. Mm. You know, because it, it, it's funny. It really makes a huge difference. Um, with where you place on iTunes. Oh, yes. You know, it's like days where we'll get, you know, we'll get a review or two and all of a sudden we're, we bumped up, you know, 12 yeah. spaces. So, yeah, reviews are, they're huge. important. They're huge. They make a huge difference. So, if you take a moment to do that, that would be pretty awesome. I hope you enjoyed this episode. We had a lot of fun making it. And <laughs> <laughs> as we always do. And uh, we will see you next week. Thank you for listening to Small Biz Life. If you enjoyed the show, please take a few minutes to rate and review the show on iTunes or Stitcher. Please visit smallbizlife.com to view today's show notes, take this week's poll, join the Facebook community, follow us on Twitter, or submit a question for the mailbag. Support the show by checking the resources page or by going to smallbizlife.com slash Amazon whenever you shop. This was Small Biz Life. This was Small Biz Life.